Professor, you are so funny, ha ha ha. Welcome back, fans. We're here at the CGPGA on the back nine, and Lucy is about to swing. What a stroke! Look at it go! It's going, it's going, it's going, it's on the green. Oh my, a hole in one! What are the probabilities that computer girls can hit a hole in one? My, those computer girls really know how to hit the ball. You should know, Professor. Computer girls always hit a hole in one. That's because we are not real. Oh, and I read your fiction, Action Adventure, The Pros Probability. It was really good. It is kind of a mystery thriller. They are hard to write and make exciting, but it worked. I like the way there are chapters in between chapters. It was fun. Oh, by the way, I got your note on the mistake in episode 10 about the mass of the electron being 9.109 to the minus 31 instead of minus 34 but you are only human but then again i would not have made the mistake t he he ha ha that is me laughing because the programmers did not give me a decent laugh sound yeah on the uh, mass of the electron yeah you know i should have checked that a little closer but the problem is in the international standards, they're using kilograms instead of the grams. So I went the wrong way with the multiple, you know, but it shouldn't be in kilograms. It should be in grams. Okay, you guys, let's get off the kilograms and do it directly in grams. Yeah, Lucy, that Gerard Frost, you know, he invents his algorithm, his probability algorithm. And with the advent of quantum computing, it, it, it predicts things that are going to happen in your life. And if you just do what the program tells you to do, you become rich and successful. And everybody buys into it, and he gets rich, and everybody gets rich. And all of a sudden, the whole world goes crazy over getting rich. And, and it just everything balloons so much, and it causes a big catastrophe on the planet. You know, pretty cool, pretty cool. Okay, class, it's time to get back to work now. Uh, coming out of episode 10, we're now in episode 11, and uh, it's really getting complicated now, okay? I didn't say physics was easy, but it answers a lot of questions, okay? So we're going to start going into the, the theory of combustion, that the combustion part one continued, and now we're going to see what actually happens in that chamber, and we're going to chase that and find out where's all the energy come from. When we do just the residual and they change the pressure and we re recompute the volume, we don't get very much energy out of it. So where's all the energy come from? Now Lucy's going to give you some really important details. Make sure you're taking notes. Slide 210.2 is one cubic centimeter to scale with the page in the treatise. The little red square is the amount of hydrogen to scale. This is how much substance was in the reaction when they were liquid then they were expanded into the chamber and burned. This is to put into perspective this experiment. The one liter chamber, you can imagine, is about the size of a one liter can of soup. So if we add up the obvious 21.42 PSI in Pascals that is 147,685.70094, times dot oh oh one equals one hundred and forty seven point six eight five joules which is the conversion to joules of equivalent energy potential of twenty one point four two psi and eighty one point five one three degrees fahrenheit or twenty seven point five degrees celsius times four point one eight two joules per degree centigrade per gram of water is 115.005 joules the total is 262.69 joules of energy so let's find the empirically stated 3737.023808 joules simply stated if we are going to get to the empirically tested value the amount of water raised by one degree celsius 
with this much oxygen and hydrogen, is 3737.023808, divided by 4.182, equals 893.59 grams, or rather 0.89359 liters raised 1 degree, or 1 liter raised 0.893590 degrees Celsius, or, of course, 1 gram raised 893.590 degrees Celsius. That seems like a lot for this small amount of fuel, until you think of a slow burn, of the expanded hydrogen, say in a tank that is 1 fourth liter in size. This would put the hydrogen at 58.8 psi, slowly burning like your camp stove. At that pressure it would probably burn for one or so minutes while it warmed your almost one liter of water, just 0.890 degrees Celsius. The professor is just trying to put in perspective, the tiny amount of hydrogen, for the large amount of joules. Thank you Lucy. Okay, you know originally when I started doing this thought experiment I thought, you know, all those electrons that come flying off because the hydrogen don't need them anymore because it gets the electrons from the from the oxygen, you know, and those electrons fly off, that those millions and millions and millions of electrons, that's where the mass was. But then when you start to add up the mass of the electron, you find out that doesn't make any sense at all. Lucy, take it away. Now, the oscilloscope and voltmeter and photo sensors will be put to use so the electron energy can be seen that comes off because of the electrons that are abandoned by the hydrogen in exchange for the oxygen's electrons this is an attempt to explain the weight and volume loss in consideration of the conventional model at the time of the ignition of the electrode spark which triggered the oscilloscope the photosensors recorded the differential of light energy as it progressed through the chamber. The electron charge from the reaction of the 8.69577 to the 24th electrons, that came off the hydrogen, accumulated in the stainless steel chamber. This shows a capacitive charge between the chamber and the copper plate, which is isolated from the chamber by the high dielectric insulators. The rest potential after the reaction, showed a potential of 262.69 joules of energy, but the reaction accelerated the new water mass. So, as a matter of investigation, let's take our mystery 3737 joules, and experiment using the formula 0.01 joule per gram, per meter, or 3737 divided by, 0.01 equals 373,700. That is one gram raised 373,700 meters in 20 milliseconds. is 4 centimeters in radius and 22.56 centimeters long. You can use your calculator if you like but the professor adjusted this diagram to be a volume of 1000 cubic centimeters just for fun. If you use a divergent vector to calculate a path of motion, and assume a general path of motion of the reaction to be 225.6 millimeters, and then reflects back then 373,700 times 1,000 equals 373,700,000, is the total millimeters. Divide that by 225.6 millimeters, so 373,700,000 divided by 225.6 equals, 1,656,471.631 bounces, in 20 milliseconds. The professor will adjust this later. I had to put on a second set of glasses because I, I got a read this thing here. You know, in, in the treatise, I, I show a little broken heart, a red broken heart, because I got a vector away from the main topic here to talk about something that's really important. 
You know, in the in the consideration of the uh, the with physicists about the Big Bang theory, it's all about causality. You know, they talk about 10 milliseconds after the event or 100 milliseconds after the event, but everything's about causality. As you get closer and closer and closer to the beginning, it all falls apart because it has to be nothing. And that's just impossible. In the treatise, the professor shows a broken heart, which means he must vector away from the main topic to discuss another point in physics before he can continue. The proponents of the Big Bang are all about causality. Every event had an event prior that caused the current event. Cause and effect, however the Big Bang concept gets into trouble when you try to find the beginning. As described before, they talk in terms like, 10 milliseconds after the Big Bang or 100 microseconds after the event, but never get to the event or consider what happened before the event. Please consider that it never happened, and consider another plausible solution to infinity, and that is just it, it is infinite. The professor has suggested, that the electron is the entry point of matter into our cognitive realm, and that is the first order of mass, that as physicists like to say, that as an electron approaches the speed of light, it becomes a wave. They also like to say that a photon is a massless particle. We seem to be caught in a realm of magic where you are asked to believe something tangible out of their imagination. So, consider that we search for the smallest particle, when there is none. It resides in infinity, and is beyond our cognitive realm, but that the concept of dark matter shows up in the large cosmos, as an effect that is undeniable when we see galaxies moving in relation to the so-called gravity force, which remains unexplained. So here is a suggestion, and the professor says he is going to take it to the bank so to speak. Electrons transition from waves in dark matter to physical entities that respond to magnetism. Photons are only waves, and they move through free space or vacuum, because no space is empty, and the ether, they searched for, that carries energy waves, but diminish mathematically to infinity in thermodynamic or magnetic interaction, is dark matter. This is matter that is just near existence in our realm, and that an electron can emerge and evaporate when the conjunction or intersection of energy conveys their existence, in true physical interaction as mass, you are engulfed in dark matter, and with targets as massive as the sun, it is dark matter that causes the surface compression and not gravity. Hydrogen is the first order element, and was not created in the Big Bang, but is continually precipitated in nebula. Progressive collisions increases a mass, that as it increases, it becomes a larger target that with heat and pressure, and not gravity come into existence. Nebula are the hydrogen creating factories that generate stars. There is no order, but a homogeneous natural event, that has literally infinite universes and galaxies colliding. So, we want to expound on this and bring it all to the black hole that is in the center of every galaxy, but let's go back to the electron which must take form before the professor can continue in the combustion experiment. The professor says he has had enough of the Niels Bohr atom concept. So much science has been developed around a flawed concept. Atoms are hard crystals, and electrons are pieces of real matter that fly off because of collisions of such force that these tiny pieces reach near the speed of light, and will slam into other matter and merge, while impelling the victim with its energy. Electrons are not orbiting the hydrogen atom, they are conveyed by the proton nucleus in a vector field. They mistake the view of the electron cloud, because no system of observation is viable, and truly the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is real. The ability to separate hydrogen from oxygen by adding electrical energy or electrons, shows a truly mechanical and measurable phenomenon. 
It is not one electron that complements the one proton, it is the mass, and spatial size of the proton that precipitates the electron or plural of such. Suffice it to say that the very real relationship with hydrogen and oxygen is measurable, and the fact that 0.0147122 grams of hydrogen and 1.141 grams of oxygen are 1.1557122 grams, and after combining they produce 1 gram of water, with a loss of mass of 0.1557122295 grams is a really good argument that the lost mass was electrons, but I caution, what is conjecture? is that the 0.0147122 grams of hydrogen contained 869 sextillion, 577 quintillion, 315 quadrillion, 858 trillion, 307 billion, 593 million, 843,783 atoms, and that if a hydrogen atom has one electron as the model suggests, then the 0.1557122295 grams of lost matter was the same amount in electrons, but the issue here is that the lost 0.1557122295 grams exceeds even the weight of the total amount of hydrogen by 0.1557122 minus 0.0147122 which equals 0.141 grams. The stated mass of the electron in current physics is 9.109 to the minus 31 kilograms, but in the high castles of quantum physics of smoke and mirrors, some mistakes can happen. Of course we deal with other issues in electromagnetic concepts that with clouded vision, math can do amazing things. If the stated value is correct that one electron weighs 9.109 to the minus 31 kilograms, then the stated number of electrons only weigh this small amount shown in grams, which is not even a dent in what is missing in weight. We know an electron has mass when it is related to an element as an ion, and that this is its only state even in plasma. This means that an electron exists as and in addition to an element's mass, and it evaporates to waves of energy when disassociated, or rather it becomes so dimensionally small, that it is then in the realm of dark matter, and not in our cognizant realm. So for the time being we are going to work with the one electron to one atom math, and continue. Sneak peek, the electron has a mass equivalence in magnetic push as a dark matter wave vector junction but has no actual mass. It is the true massless particle. So there you can see from that analysis that the mass of the electron doesn't add up for the amount of mass we actually lost in the combustion of hydrogen and oxygen. So now we're going to explore how the hydrogen rams into the oxygen, and I do mean rams into the oxygen, and combines with the oxygen to become a new stable element, a new crystal compound. Here is perhaps what oxygen looks like that has been impaled with two hydrogen atoms. In the traditional model the hydrogen sheds its electrons and adopts the two valence electrons of the oxygen, and thus becomes a water molecule with very fascinating stable properties, and yes, it too is a hard crystal, but just above zero degrees Celsius the molecules are fluid and just below freezing they form amazing non-repeating hexagonal crystals, jack frost, that expand until at very cold temperatures they contract, and at even colder temperatures they match the sheer modulus of steel. It is not too difficult to think of oxygen and hydrogen as water, and then frozen to become a hard crystal, so it should not be difficult to see the molecule itself as a hard crystal on its own. So, let's explore how hydrogen rams into oxygen and breaks in, to join as a new stable compound. The professor does mean the hydrogen rams into the oxygen, and not the other way around, but in free space they must reach equal isotropy, but it is the hydrogen that enters the oxygen. So then another consideration of causality. The reaction in the chamber happened, 
but the electrode is what caused it to happen. So we have to analyze everything about the electron and the electrode, and the electron and the electrode, and the cause of the explosion. Let's look deeply into causality, which means we must see the catalyst that causes the event. This being the electric spark that started the reaction. The electrode in the chamber is just like a spark plug in a car engine. The outer rim is the ground, and the center point is a positive voltage source. The theory of electricity is an enormous field of study, but we are only concerned with our simple electrode. It has been long known that electrons flow from the ground to the positive electrode. More importantly is the circuit that is required to cause electrons to move. In the case of a battery, a chemical process between two metal plates, and a solution called an electrolyte, cause the potential difference between the positive and negative poles. You can use a device called a capacitor to do a similar thing, of producing a potential difference. You can take two sheets of aluminum foil, and a piece of wax paper, and roll them up with the paper in between the foil, and it is a capacitor. If you apply a direct current voltage from say a battery, the foil will pick up a charge with one side being negative with respect to the other. Connect the foil with a wire, and then connect it to a light bulb, and it will light for a quick short while. All of this is just to explain that you must have an abundance of electrons in one place spatially in a media, and another place spatially that is lacking electrons, and then they will move when you place a conductor between the two. There is so much science related to the electron and its interaction in our universe, and it is all around the magical charge philosophy, and to the attractive and repulsive forces. The professor believes it is because of the magnet that the confusion arises. The magical magnet, that in one direction attracts, and in the other direction it pushes, and because there is dead air between, it becomes a field of force in the unknown. So, let's simplify. There is no such thing as an attractive force. Just like there is no such thing as zero. There are only differentials. There can be lesser pressure, but there is no such thing as no pressure, and zero degrees Kelvin is not zero at all. Zero would have to be no energy, not even rotation of one arc second in infinity. The professor hopes you get this. There is only one force in the universe, and that is pressure. All other forces are misobservations. Electrons are not attracted to protons. All energy moves entropically, and in the path of least resistance. And when we say dead air, remember, no space is empty. Back to our electrode that looks like a spark plug. The electrons in the ground are abundant. All we have to do is make a hole, and they can be pushed through space in a plasma flow. The odd thing about electrons is they do not exist isolated as an entity on their own, they are always an ion of something. A free electron evaporates as a wave in dark matter. This in itself is revealing about dark matter and indicates that it is truly matter, and an electron is the first order mass in our realm. Atoms of an element are targets, or rather collectors that intercept and collect particles of dark matter, and build mass. Potential difference should be seen as a physical state of pressure, as in heavier. An ion in plasma, is an atom of some element traveling with an excess electron or multiple electrons because its mass has increased in relation to its neighbor atoms. Like steam coming off the top of boiling water, and again traveling in the path of least resistance, the ion is pushed off the negative region, and moves to the positive region of less pressure. This is just another explanation of charge potential. All the math remains the same, only the observation is different. 
I will refer you to plasma studies for more, but for now to get back to our experiment, and finish this causality, the electrode causes a near light speed event. Since the electrode is made of steel, a flow of iron ions, moved through the space between the ground and the positive electrode because they were pushed. Everything else in the vicinity was stable except the positive electrode which was spatially lacking in density, and a physical plasma collides or bumps into a hydrogen atom hard enough to send it flying into an oxygen atom. Since hydrogen is H2, it is actually two atoms that have the inertia to break the oxygen. One hydrogen alone will not crack the shell. All of the other math related to the electron exchange can, and does apply for all practical purposes, but the quantum physics is arguable. The fact remains that 1.15571229 grams of hydrogen, and oxygen turns into one gram of water. Back to slide 211, we were discussing the velocity action that begins at the electrode and progresses. We are going to slow time down to step by step. First the electron plasma spark hits an H2 molecule and slams it into an oxygen molecule. This separates the O2 to just O, and the two hydrogen atoms embed in the oxygen while two electrons fly off. This starts a chain reaction of collisions that move through the space of the chamber. The original collision swells the oxygen now water. The amount it swells will be continually changing as the reaction progresses, because like in a steam engine boiler, as the temperature goes up so does the pressure by the equation, P times V, divided by T, equals K. So now in a, in a very complex manner, we start to add up all the energies and the volumes, and we start to measure the dimensions of the atoms and the new compounds, and it's amazing what we find. What the professor is showing here, is the motion is not flying off in some direction, the motion is swelling. When you get burned from hot water, the molecules are not bouncing around they are changing dimension very rapidly. This causes your skin cells to change dimension so rapidly that it destroys the cells, and you say ouch. The waves in slide 211 are reaction waves and they are very energetic or rather, they are high energy. The professor is translating the waves into an impact event, that every time the wave reaches the chamber wall, the wall with its high isotropy or density, returns the wave. These pressure waves produce 1,656,471.631 echoes over a distance of 225.6 millimeters. The waves are pushing out in all directions but are contained by the chamber much like a cylinder in a car engine. How we got here, and we know this is complicated, is the professor took the empirical data on what is expected, and worked backward. Since the 262.69 joules of post-reaction is what is left over, it was produced by the total energy of 3737.023808 joules. We will use the value established and heralded by the National Institute of Standards which is 0 0.01 joule per gram per meter. Take the total energy expected and apply the math. 3737.023808 divided by 0 0.01 equals 373,702.3808. This means our one gram of water could be raised 373,702.3808 meters or 373,702,380.8 millimeters. This would be, as shown, this large number of molecules of water, is pressed against each other and against 567 square centimeters of surface area of the chamber oscillating and entrapped, with an energy wave crossing. In the treatise, 
the professor shows the calculation of surface area of a sphere which is 4 pi times the radius squared for the round ends, and pi times the diameter times the height for the surface area of a cylinder for 566.99 or 567 square centimeters. Thus 373,702.3808 divided by the number of molecules equals 8.595 to the power of minus 19. This is each molecule contributes 8.595 to the minus 19 grams per meter of energy. The compression is substantial and without proof and only conjecture it is likely the collision sent the new water molecule spinning. The now bent molecule wobbles and slams into other hydrogen and oxygen atoms causing collisions of sufficient velocity to break and combine. Nothing is moving linearly except the energy wave and it is transferring its energy to the containing walls of the chamber. Each event of the creation of a water molecule causes a unique wave. If you have ever watched raindrops on a pond, you can see thousands of waves crossing. The professor is using a known quantity of energy for a simulation, 8.595 to the minus 19 grams per meter, distributed over 567 square centimeters of area gives 1.5158 to the minus 21 gram meters per centimeter. Now using millimeters in a general consideration, each event regardless of its position at the time of collision, travels the same distance to the containing walls of the chamber, so given the known gram meter distance we find, 373,702,380.8 divided by 230.9 equals 1,618,459.856 echoes, or standing waves. This is the adjusted angular average. 230.9 millimeters is the average distance a shock wave travels before striking a wall. The wave dissipates after 1,618,459.856 wall impacts in 20 milliseconds. Again let's look at just one event of the first creation of one molecule. The volume of two hydrogen atoms is, volume equals 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed times 2, or 4.18879 times 124,788.24289 picometers cubed times 2 equals 249,576.497 picometers cubed, if you are using a sphere. In free space, at temperatures above its liquid state, and not a crystal with other hydrogen atoms, spherical dimensions are perhaps closer to reality. Likewise oxygen which is a proven square crystal when liberated to a gas is perhaps more spherical than square. So, we continue. The volume of one oxygen atom is 4.18879 times 287,496 equals 1,204,260.36984 picometers cubed. So, if we were to simply sum the volume it would be inaccurate at 1,453,836.925 picometers cubed. We know the hydrogen is partially embedded in the oxygen, and the indication is that as shown on page 48 in the treatise, the molecule of water is bent, which explains their odd performance when associated. They immediately bond as 2H2O, and cling symmetrically, always producing the smallest surface area of a group of molecules. The odd configuration of the angle of the hydrogen causes the never-ending free frozen patterns of the solid crystal. Slide 215 is more proportional as to the size of the hydrogen compared to the oxygen. The hydrogen being exposed, causes it to be responsible for a phenomenon called hydrogen bonding, which is responsible for the two molecules joining as 2H2O. 
It gives water the ability to adapt its pH rapidly, which is why it is such a good solvent. It is said that the molecule is always in a state of reformulation with the hydrogen continually reassociating. Water's pH is neutral, but because of the hydrogen's mobility, a completely pure deionized beaker of water can change its pH, with the introduction of a grain of mineral salt in under 200 femtoseconds. It is acid or base in rapid ionization depending on the mineral. The professor is using a best guess of a separation radius for the new water molecule, of 70.276 picometers as stated on page 48. The declared bent molecule has a dimension of 95.84 picometers, but that is not a true radius. The issue here is the reordering of space. He will hold with the fact that the experiment started with 1.15571229.5 grams that measured 1.207224 cubic centimeters, and after combustion there is 1 cubic centimeter of water that weighs 1 gram. There was lost 0.207224 cubic centimeters of volume and 0.15571229.5 grams of weight. Professor, I think we must carry over to the next episode to finish, because we have two more spatial extrapolations to consider to complete combustion part 1. It leaves this episode anticlimactic but the next two considerations are complex and very important. Thank you Lucy. Well as usual we run long in this segment, really complicated. But it's going to be uh, fascinating when we go into combustion part two because it just gets even more impressive. So thanks for joining me.